what happened that day, I woke up from a dream. I dreamt I was at the Lidra Palace Hotel. Beautiful hotel, right on the border between the Greek side and the Turkish side, and it used to look over the Armenian quarter. I dreamt I was in that hotel with President Makarios. In my dream, Makarios finished his speech, took out a grenade from his robe and threw it over his shoulder. I thought, shit, that's going to land in the Turkish side. That's going to set off a war. And the next thing I know, my mum's in my room shaking my leg. Get up, get up, get up. Come, come on, come, 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 come away from the window. Bullets flying past the window, bombs are going off, and it really is a war. I was 13 during the war. My first thought while all of this is going on was that I should record it. I picked up an old school book, I tore out a bunch of pages, and I started writing down everything that was going on. 8 a.m., bombs falling, bullets flying. Very unemotional, very like a reporter. I have no idea why I did it. Maybe it was a tactic to stop getting emotional or whatever. But I literally wrote down everything. Because there was no warning, this just came out of, you know. We slam the shutters shut, we get into the kitchen, thinking, where is everyone? What's happening? I mean, what is going on? So then my dad turns up, and he'd been downtown at the shop with my grandfather, and he's walked up from downtown with the army, with the tanks, and he's chatted away to them, like, oh, what's going on? And then they said, it's a coup. We're overtaking the palace. Well, where we live is less than a mile, less than half a mile to the palace. There was this rumor that the Turks were actually going to invade. Half of the people were saying, no, it's never going to happen. They'll never do it. They'll never do it. The other half of the people were saying, well, they're beginning to, you know, amass ships. Everything calmed down after a few days. Having been stuck in the house with the curfew and everything like that, my parents decided to let us go to the swimming pool. This is probably one of the last tickets ever sold to the Lidra Palace for swimming. We had only been there for about half an hour when my father turned up. He wouldn't tell us anything, he wouldn't explain anything. He was just like, you, 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 get up, we're going. And I was like, what do you mean we're going? And I sort of looked around and I noticed everyone else is leaving too. And then when we got in the car to go home, it was absolute pandemonium. The next morning, the Turks invaded. There was a curfew every night. You couldn't have lights on. There wasn't any food in the shops. You couldn't find goods, you couldn't find things. All of the neighbors were in our basement. And all through this, I continued to write. My favorite pages in the diary are these two. Basically, I was writing in a complete blackout. It was all squashed together, so I rewrote it here so that I could actually read it the next day. The next page, I put my hand on the page and I wrote in between my fingers, like that, so that I wouldn't write on top of myself.
Cyprus is a tiny island. Strategically, a very important island because it's right in the middle of the Mediterranean and right in the middle of the Middle East. Anything that went through to the Middle East or to Europe from there, it went through Cyprus. The Assyrians, and Lucinians, Venetians, Roman Empire was part of the Ottoman Empire for 300 years. It was part of the Roman Empire ages ago. Everybody has wanted Cyprus and everybody has had a hand in it. My grandfather came from Karpert in Turkey, which was the Ottoman Empire at the time. The Armenians living in the Ottoman Empire were subjected to increasing repressions, which culminated in the genocide. My family survived the genocide and continued to live in the Ottoman Empire. Between 22 and 23, the Ottoman Empire became the Republic of Turkey. Everyone who was not a Turk was kicked out. My great-grandmother's family were all kicked out. They lost everything, all of their business, property, family, everything. They moved to Aleppo in Syria. My grandmother met my grandfather, love affair. He was a real character. He ended up in Cyprus. There's Nicosia. That's where I'm from. Cyprus at the time, in the 20s and 30s, still under British rule, was seen as a very uh, safe place to live and to set up your business. Cyprus became an independent country in 1960 with its own government and a president, President Makarios. It was an idyllic island. You don't lock your door, you go to your friend's house, you go out to eat, you go to the beach. Until 1974, Cyprus was an idyllic island. Even though there were several different minorities and groups of people living in Cyprus, everyone got on. In each city, you would have the Greek quarter and the Turkish quarter. You didn't have to cross a checkpoint or show a passport or anything like that. You could go anywhere you wanted. My grandfather had a shirt shop in Cyprus they became the shirt makers to the president for every president except probably the last two. The shop was very central to our lives. It was in a very popular part of town. It was down in Lidra Street. It was a real social scene. You know, you'd come and get measured up, but there'd be several coffees and a lot of gossip, and this one would come and that one would go. My grandfather's shop was a treasure trove for me. There were cardboard boxes, you had a little hexagon of fabric on it, and you'd open it and there would be 10 shirts all the same. I loved going there. There was a gang of us, and in this gang, the only thing you had to do to be part of the gang was exist. It was a big mishmash of friends, Greek Cypriots, Turkish Cypriots, Armenians, friends who came to Cyprus only for the summer and went to school in England, or English and they came to work for the bank or the embassy. It was very much a culture of the summer. School ended and then summer was sacrosanct. Everyone was into music. 
growing your hair long, growing a beard, wearing tight shirts, tight pants, high, high platforms, massive flares. We were on the motorcycle. Whoever had a car, everyone piled in the car. We snuck out at night to look at the stars. I would wake up in my house sometimes, there'd be three friends of mine sitting on the floor of my bedroom looking through my album covers, saying, I just want to borrow an album. And I'm like, I didn't even hear you come in. And they were like, we just hopped over the bed. You know, they'd just like jump in through the bedroom window. Turkey invaded and they took half of the island. And I remember very clearly the morning that the Turks invaded the second time. I woke up and I moved and I remember displacing the cat. The next thing I hear is like of a plane swooping over the house. That was like at 5.15. We got up, the bombs were so heavy, everyone in the street was screaming, everyone was running into our basement. We all managed to grab bags, pack the bags, get in the car, we're in the car, the streets, everything's on fire. We got to this checkpoint and they dragged out every kid who looked of age to carry a gun. They would not let the cars go past with the boys in, 16, 17, 18 years old. At the time, I was just thinking, that looks like some of my friends' older brothers. What they must have been going through, mums to have their kids, you know, and not even know what was gonna happen. Because at that point, none of us knew what was gonna happen. We all go to Decalia, and when we get to Decalia, they separate us. My brother, my cousin, my uncle, we all have British passports, but my mother and my aunt and my grandfather, my grandfather don't. Big no across, you know, no, 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 they can't go. My father had stayed behind to look after the house and my great grandmother. My great-grandmother, who'd lived through the genocide, First World War, Second World War, she said, I'm not leaving my house. This is my house. The Turks are my friends. My mother, my aunt, and my grandparents stayed at the refugee camp. My mother, like Paddington Bear, she wrote down the addresses of my aunts and uncles in England. She put them in my pocket so I wouldn't get lost. <laughs> After five days, we got evacuated. We went to stay with my grandmother down in Devon. I kept the diary while I went through all of this. My last entry into the diary was after I arrived in England, and it was when the American ambassador was shot dead. They were rioting against the Americans for providing arms to the Turks. For 40 years, the diary just sat at the bottom of a drawer. I thought, well, it's 40 years since the war. And I remember when I wrote it being very matter of fact and being very much like Fire a journalist. Bombs, mortars, guns, Greek army fighting against President Makarios, fighting all around the house. And, and when I read it, I just wept buckets because everything came back to me. I sent off a couple of emails to friends of mine in Cyprus. I said, what do I do with this diary? Let me do something. I decided, OK, I need to put the diary in a gallery. It was an amazing little gallery called Apotheki. The Apotheki was right in the old part of town, right on the border, 
few yards from the Greek checkpoint, you've got the buffer zone, and then you've got the Turkish side. I wanted it all to be as authentic as possible. I decided to recreate my grandfather's shop as if it had been left 40 years ago and we'd run away because of the war. So I wanted an air of abandonment. I decided to print the diary big on vintage cloth from my grandfather's shop. Who printed it was one of my classmates from 1974. Who framed it was an artist I met at the time. I had an opening night on July the 14th so that people could come and see what happened at eight o'clock the next morning, 40 years ago. Good evening. Merhaba. Kalispera sas. Thank you all for coming. There are so many faces here that I know and I recognize from a long time ago. 40 years ago, tomorrow, I woke up to the sounds of war <laughs> and I picked up my pen and an old school book and started writing what I saw and heard around me. I'm happy to present the diary here for you to read today. It's going to get dark, so take a torch and read the diary. Before we do that, we're going to have a little performance here. DFPS. Όλοι οι Άγγλοι υπήκοοι να παραμείνουν στον τόπο του. Όλο το νοσοκομειακό προσωπικό εκτό υπηρεσία παρακαλώ παρουσιαστείτε άμεσα. July 15th, time 9:52 a.m. Outside sky covered with smoke. Machine gun fire still continuous. July 15th, time 10:02 a.m. Helicopter above. Think it's UN. Rick taken over by National Guard. Do not be afraid of the time. 10:20 a.m. Everything quiet for a while. July 15th. Times like the afternoon. There was shooting near us to the west. Turkish planes keep coming. Just leaving the diary, very simple, and just leaving it on the wall was like a platform for people's own memories and thoughts. I had a guy come in and he said, I was six years old, that was my birthday, and I was like, why am I not having a party? A woman walked in and she saw the sewing machine. She burst into tears. My sister saved up to buy a Kaiser machine because it was supposed to be the best. We left it on the table in the kitchen. She never stopped talking about that machine. Another friend of mine came and he said, that day in July, I was listening to the BBC and I heard them say the Turks have landed in Kyrenia. I ran to my dad, I said, we got to empty our warehouse. And my dad was like, oh, that's, the Turks aren't coming, so what? We looked on the wall and there it was, the Turks have landed in Kyrenia. And I said, that's what you heard. And he said, and that's where we lost everything. The town of Nicosia is surrounded and the only road that was unblocked to the south is now cut off at Piri, near Larnaca. I was very privileged because we went away for a year and then I was able to come back and my family were there and our family business hadn't suffered too much. We hadn't physically lost anything, except that some people never quite got over the fact that they were no longer living in this bubble, this island where everything was safe. You could go and do anything you wanted. And to have that rug pulled out from under your feet it wasn't just that you couldn't go and see your friend on the other side of the border. It was the fact that 
Your house was no longer there. Your friendships were no longer there. Things that were intangible were no longer there. There's two suicides. There's a death from binge drinking. One of my good friends died and was found two weeks later from a drug overdose. A couple of car crashes through reckless driving. I had a friend who died last year in a car crash. Very close, I would call him family. He carried a photo album from the 70s in his car with him. Always. He was never without a photo album of all of the gang. The border has always been very contentious. After the Turks took half the island, everyone who lived on the south had to move to the north. Everyone who lived on the north had to move to the south. It was basically divided between Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots. People still don't cross the border because of the principle of visiting your house where you grew up that is now somebody else's because of what? If I take you by the hand right now, I can take you to a dusty little plot of land. And we have to cross a Greek checkpoint to get in there. We have to talk to the soldier at the gate. And if he's nice, he lets us in because you're supposed to only go in at 11 o'clock on a Sunday. We might have a UN escort. And up on the hill, there's going to be the Turkish flag smiling down on us. And we are in the Armenian cemetery. And it's in no man's land. People ask me, they said, well, you're not Greek Cypriot, or you're not Turkish Cypriot, you're sort of half this, half that. In that cemetery is my great great aunt, my grandmother, my grandfather, my great grandmother, my uncle, and my father. And they come from Mosul, Urfa, England, all over the world, all buried in that plot of land. And so I say, who? is a Cypriot. Who is a Cypriot? Is it someone that's just born in Cyprus or is it somebody that lived their life and died there? Living here in Cyprus, we are all acutely aware of continuing conflicts around us. I hope that with small steps like this one today, we can continue dialogue between communities and ask for peace, not just here in Cyprus, but within the Middle East. And with that, I say thank you. Inshallah, God bless you. Park Asutov, enjoy. Thank you.